It's Game Boy World, and this is Bugs Bunny in Crazy Castle. Crazy Castle is arguably not the first NES conversion we've seen for Game Boy. That distinction probably properly belongs to baseball, but it's definitely the system's first near simultaneous NES conversion. Well, sort of. The Crazy Castle series is probably publisher Chemco's most enduring legacy, which is kind of a shame because it's not really that great, and it largely relied on licensed characters. Eventually, Kid Clown became the series' original breakout star, but only if you play fast and loose with the definitions of breakout and star. While a perfectly competent action series in the mold of classic single-screen arcade titles from the early 80s, Crazy Castle felt a bit behind the times in its 1989 debut, and it didn't become any less creaky as the years marched forward. Designed in the style of single-screen puzzle action games, Crazy Castle owes a great debt to things like Chunsoft's Door Door. You control Bugs Bunny as he wanders through a castle trying to collect carrots while avoiding enemies. Bugs can't jump because obviously a jumping rabbit character would just be silly. So in order to evade your foes, you instead need to make use of the environment and fake out the bad guys. You can climb stairs, drop from ledges, and duck into doors containing staircases to climb to higher levels, and later levels introduce more complex elements like twisting mazes of pipes. And that's about it. The different enemies seem to behave fairly erratically, which can make it difficult to kite them effectively. Sylvester and Yosemite Sam seem pretty mindless and wander aimlessly, while Daffy Duck is more aggressive. Clearly the duck carries some sort of lingering resentment from the whole rabbit season, duck season argument. Duck season! Rabbit season! Rabbit season! Duck season! Rabbit season! I say it's duck season, and I say fire! And so he totally fixates on Bugs, shadowing his every movement and often getting a jump on where the player wants to go. Bugs isn't completely helpless though. Occasionally you'll find things like invincibility potions and boxing gloves that you can use to take enemies out of the picture, and mercifully, once down the bad guys stay down for the remainder of the round. And in classic cartoon style you can also drop safes and other heavy objects on the bad guy's head from above. It's a solid enough game if slightly archaic. The Game Boy, being a simpler and more primitive piece of technology, seems like a more appropriate venue for the game than the NES, though the NES version is easier since it gives you a wider field of vision to deal with. Really though, most of the series' problems come from the licensing element involved. Certainly that shows through in the tortured legacy of this early Game Boy title. Kemco, the video game subsidiary of Kotobuki Engineering and Manufacturing, that's K-E-M-Co, had been part of the second wave of Famicom third-party licensees. They debuted by releasing a port of the Commodore 64 shooter Doughboy toward the end of 1985, and went on from there. Kemco seems to have developed an eye for converting Western releases for Famicom, and then reverse importing them to the West. In fact, NES fans probably know them best for their console conversions of the MacVenture Graphical Adventure trilogy, Shadowgate, Deja Vu, and Uninvited. The company's tendency toward Western properties, licensing, and their strong relationship with Nintendo almost certainly accounts for the existence of Bugs Bunny and Crazy Castle, the ninth game ever released in Japan for Game Boy. Except, wait. In Japan, the game was simply called Mickey Mouse. But wait, even that wasn't the original game. Crazy Castle actually got its start as a Famicom disc system release called Roger Rabbit. Based on the previous year's movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit, this was exactly the same game as Crazy Castle, but with different sprites. Sadly, LJN had the rights to Roger Rabbit in the US, and hired Rare to create an ambitious but wildly uneven action-adventure game based on the movie. So, Kimco tweaked the sprites for the US, and made it into a Bugs Bunny game. Because, you know, rabbits. The Roger Rabbit connection is pretty obvious if you look for it. The NES enemy sprites retain the colorations of Judge Doom's weasels, and even move like the weasels. The presence of punch gloves and falling safes also makes a heck of a lot more sense when you know that they were inspired by Roger Rabbit. All it's missing is a falling piano. Only he got the drop on us. Literally. Dropped the piano on us from 15 stories. Broke my arm. Said he never made it. I never did find out who that guy was. Bugs Bunny and Crazy Castle for NES hit the US a few weeks before the game made its Japanese debut as Mickey Mouse for Game Boy. Despite being released about half a year after Roger Rabbit's launch, Game Boy's Mickey Mouse evidently no longer had the rights to that property, so it defaulted to a different cartoon license. And since Capcom had wrapped up the general Disney license for America by that point, the US Game Boy release adopted the same property as its NES counterpart, Bugs Bunny. 
What a mess. While the uncredited Famicom disk system and NES versions of the game appear to have been developed internally at Kemco based on the fact that one of the company's composers and sound engineers, Hiroyuki Masuno, claims to have worked on them, the parentage of the Game Boy ports is less certain. At the very least, Masuno doesn't cite the Game Boy versions on his curriculum vitae. It also seems likely that the Famicom Disk System slash NES team didn't work on the Game Boy releases, if only as a matter of logistics. All four versions of the game arrived within the space of about 13 months, which isn't impossible for a single team to handle, but definitely seems unlikely. Plus, the Game Boy releases feel much more distinct from Roger Rabbit than the NES Crazy Castle. The sprites look and move differently, having undergone considerably more refinement than the thinly veiled paint jobs of NES Crazy Castle. But, since Japanese publishers didn't really feel the need to credit creators, and especially Ghost House Studios back in the day, we'll probably never know. Not that much of anyone really seems to care. Crazy Castle was a fun but generally forgettable release for Game Boy. Like a lot of other early Game Boy games, the novelty value of having a portable NES title trumped the workmanlike quality of its design. And besides, it's not as though there wouldn't be plenty of other opportunities to play Crazy Castle through the years. For more in-depth analyses of forgotten licensed console conversions, keep reading GameBoyWorld.com.